The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. That was beautiful. This morning we're starting a study for the book of Romans, and I've had butterflies all week. So I wanted to start this morning just why, why Romans? If you'll open up to Romans chapter 1, verse 7, Paul writes to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Why Romans? Because gospel is for the saved. This is being written to those who are loved of God in Rome. Uh, the gospel is to, to be our lifeline and our food, for from it flows all the springs of life and godliness. And so the most important thing for any child of God is to be growing in the gospel. There's nothing more excellent that we could give our time and thought and meditations to than the gospel of Jesus Christ. To, to fight the good fight of faith, to know this and love it and rest in it. And so as we begin, I want to give you a few quotes from some of the giants of the faith from the Reformation and that cha- life-changing time in the history of the world. William Tyndale said, Romans is the principal and most excellent part of the New Testament. It's close to one of the oldest books of the New Testament. It was written at the end of Paul's third missionary journey. And it's placed in the canon right after Acts with the spread of the gospel. It's that first epistle just set in there, I think, because of its preeminence and importance. Martin Luther, the German bull, said, Romans is worthy that not only should every Christian know it word for word by heart, but should occupy himself with it every day. It can never be read and pondered and preached too much. In fact, the more it is dealt with, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. John Calvin said, to grasp the meaning of Romans is the key to the most profound truth of Scripture. And so I don't think we can use hyperbole in talking about the importance of us grasping the truth of the gospel that is revealed to us in the epistle of Romans. To understand this gospel, to believe it, to trust it, to live it, to herald, and to die in it, I pray for the excellence of what we are going to be doing in the months and years ahead. Secondly, why Romans? Well, Romans has been one of God's chief instruments in awakening His church and spreading the gospel in the world. I want to just take one little strand by way of example for us this morning. There was a man in the fourth century born in North Africa. He was born to a very godly mother and unsafe father. And as he grew, he rejected his mother's faith. And he began living such a debauched life that he surely would have died (coughs) very young at the pace he was living. He was extremely immoral, and yet he was a very brilliant man. He taught at the best school in the area. He became an incredible scholar and taught in Milan at the university. And one day, this man was sitting in a garden, and he sat weeping over his sin and the emptiness of his heart that had followed this debauched life. And when he heard, he said, almost like a a voice of a child that said, take up and read, take up and read. And he went and he took up his Bible and he he just opened it up and he turned to Romans 13, verses 13 to 14 that says this. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. He was converted on the spot. It was St. Augustine of Hippo, and he became a guiding light in the Christian church. He was a mighty, mighty man of the faith. He fought the Pelagian heresy, and the way he demolished it was by expounding Romans. Romans was the bedrock that the church was very much founded on then out of the gate. He established an order of monks that was founded by Augustine. A thousand years later, there was a monk from that order He was named Martin Luther, and Martin Luther came to Germany. He was a brilliant man as well, pursuing life and law. And one day he was riding his horse, and he was struck by lightning, and he was knocked off the horse, and he gave himself to the priesthood. 
He had a high view of God, needless to say. And he became troubled greatly over his sin and his need to be right with this God. And he pursued hard after righteousness in hopes of maybe being accepted by God. He went into a monastery and he he wearied the other priests with hours and hours and hours of confession over his sin in this monastery. And it was making him crazy and everybody else. And he was asked once, what is it that you want, Martin? He said, I want a God who loves me and a God that I can love. Love God, I hate him because he's given me a standard of righteousness that I cannot keep. The righteousness of God was crushing this man. And as he was one day teaching through Romans, he's laboring over Romans 1.17, for in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. And the spirit broke in and he showed Luther that the righteousness that God requires to be in his presence is the righteousness that he gives freely in his son. He gives freely in his son by faith and not by works. And this man was altogether born again and set free from the bondage of law and trying to achieve a righteousness in his own power and strength. And so sprang the Protestant Reformation. A hundred years later, a group gathered together to study Romans. And they were reading Luther's preface then to Romans. And while it was being read, one of those attending by the name of John Wesley, a minister, on May 24, 1738 in Aldergate Street in London, he had been taught justification by faith in Christ alone, and he understood it with his mind. And as he listened, he said his heart was strangely warmed, and he knew that God had forgiven his sins, and he said, even mine. He had been going all over preaching this gospel, and in that day... Finally, even his sins had been forgiven. And he was saved at that moment, and he was used of God mightily for the advancement of the kingdom of God and a great awakening that swept through Europe and America. History is filled with these stories of how many were saved in Romans and how uh, major the transformation has come from this book. And I'd like to share how it intersected and ministered in my own life. As a Christian, I'd come under legalistic teaching, The only way I could rest in Christ was if I cleaned up my life enough. And I was daily given to the task, much like Luther. I was going after it with all of my heart. I was so zealous, I'd get up at three in the morning on Sundays to start preparing my heart so that when I came to worship, my mind would not drift and wander from God during my worship. And the harder I tried, the more this crazy mind kept drifting. And I would discipline myself reading through the Bible time and time again each year. I had two-hour quiet times that I never missed, maybe once or twice max in a year. I was fighting sin with passion so that I could rest in Jesus Christ, so I could find the peace that Luther found. And then in Romans, I remember I was sitting at my brother Mike in, in Joe's apartment complex, and I was doing a workout, and I'll never forget, I was sitting on the leg machines, and this is a side note, guys, never skip leg days. I, I see some of you... You just get bulked up and you got these little scrawny legs. Don't, <laughs> don't do it. But as I was sitting there, God just came upon me in the most mighty way. And I'm going to read to you what verses he led me to. In Romans 4, 4. To the one who works, his wage is cre- not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly... His faith is credited as righteousness. To the one who does not work but believes, this righteousness will be given to him. And then I came to verse 16 of chapter 4. For this reason, it's by faith, in order that it might be in accordance with grace that the promise can be guaranteed or certain. And I finally found this connection that grace is God has done all of the work. And the only way he can give that to us, the only thing that will fit with that is faith. Because if it was by works, you would never know if you did enough. You couldn't get it. And so the only way to receive this gospel was with an empty hand and looking to Christ alone so that you could be absolutely certain of your salvation. And I just sat there weeping for hours in this weight room and came home and just began reading through Romans and spent a whole day just overwhelmed at the freeness of this gospel 
and what God offers to us in Christ. This gift from God that he gave me will be so beneficial in our study for those who don't understand how to be more holy by living under grace rather than living under law. And we're going to learn that in this book. A freedom unto holiness that I just can't wait to show you and teach you in Romans. So, 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, I set out to preach through Romans when we began Southside Bible Church. I'd come under what was called hyper-Calvinism, where God was sovereign and man had no responsibility, and I got lost in it, and I got lost in illegalism, as I just shared, and lost the gospel. And as we began Southside, I needed the gospel sorted out in my heart, and I labored hard in Romans. I had this little study right off of my bedroom, and I'll remember how hot it was in the summers, and just laboring in there for hours upon hours upon hours, trying to understand this book and the beauties and the glories of the truth in it. I needed it sorted out. I needed to recover the gospel in my own heart. And that's what I preached here at Southside Bible Church. And then I taught it at Grace Chapel in a community group. And God met us in power. And I've shared about, I taught it to the college kids. We had about three or four of us that decided to go through Romans. And we studied all the awakenings and revivals and said, why not us? And we we spent about three or four years in Romans. And the last night... We had like 88 to 90 of them sitting in my living room. And all of us were testifying of what Romans did in our hearts and how many were saved, how many were headed off to the mission field, how many want to be pastors. And it was overwhelming. And Laura and I went to bed and said, surely a revival has taken place in this group. And then a a year ago to two years ago, we started a community group at my house and we began studying Romans. And what happened is I started having people who have been at Southside since we began. And they started saying, I'm, I'm seeing the gospel in a way like I've never seen it. And they were just, life was being breathed into them. And then I went away on sabbatical and it wasn't an audible voice, but it was such an overwhelming thought while I was uh, over there in Europe that Romans is what I want to preach to Southside Bible Church again. And so what I've entitled this series is The Revival That Began in 2020. That's my prayer. It's, I can title it whatever I want, right? <laughs> but my prayer is what I've been watching God do in this book as he's been unfolding and opening it up to my own heart. Is if, if we'll behold this and understand it, this is going to revive your heart in a beautiful and an amazing way. And so I'm asking him to do that work as we open up this amazing letter that God has given us by His Holy Spirit. So here's how I want to do it. I want you to just kind of hear my heart as we begin. I don't want to look at every verse from every angle like we did the first time. It took me five years, and I don't don't want to do it again in five years. But I do want to reserve the right that (laughs) we might need it. But all I looked at was the doctrinal connections. And I was really, again, trying to recover my understanding of the theological part of the gospel. And this time what I want to do is take the skeleton, the doctrinal connections. You can't get away from those. You must have those. And so we will establish the doctrinal connections of what Paul is doing. But I want to focus in on the connections of the therefores and as a result and, and look at and understand how this whole thing works together together. And I want to understand law and grace. I want, I want to help you as parents how to parent by grace and not by law. We are so prone to parent by law instead of grace. And I want us to understand and get these truths and then bring them into our everyday life. I want to go to Romans 8 and it says, mortify the flesh, put it to death. And I want to know how do I do that? How do I practically take that doctrine and begin killing sin by the spirit in my life? How do we fight with the gospel against the attacks of the enemy in Romans 8? I want deathbed people who know how to do Romans 8 and say, who can bring a charge against God's elect? He's the one who justifies. And and to learn how to fight with scripture and battle the enemy and how to deal with these truths. I want evangelism where this gospel takes over your heart and you're compelled. You're debtors, as Paul's going to say in a few verses. We're debtors to this gospel for missions. I'm praying for 25 missionaries to be sent out before we 
finish and that number doesn't mean anything. I just want God to send out people who say, I got to take this message somewhere. Church planting and our lives together in Romans 12. That's what I want to come from our study this time. And I believe that is what Paul wants for his readers when he penned this the first time, and I want to show you why. Look at Romans 1.5. Romans 1.5. Paul says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about what? The obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. I, I've been called, and I have this grace, this message. I want to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, for his glory. Now flip to the end of the book, chapter 16. <clears throat> I pray my sinus infections healed by the time we finish Romans. Verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to the obedience of faith. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be glory forever. Amen. And so we have this sandwich of Paul saying, I'm writing and my calling and what God has done is to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles for all of God's glory as he gathers in the nations. And so this gospel is to bring about the obedience of faith. And when we get there, we're going to park on it a little bit. It's, it's, this genitive can be the, the obedience that is faith or the obedience that springs from faith. And there's a lot of debate, but I, where, where I will land is what I see going on is I'm, I'm writing that you will obey and believe this gospel. And what comes out of this faith is going to be a life of faithfulness. And so the, the two are just so interlinked. And Paul is saying that I'm writing this to bring about the obedience of faith in the Gentiles. And so I'm preaching this to see the obedience of faith in every one of us. We, we live in a day and age where obedience of faith is just drifting and going away. And I want for this body is that this gospel, we believe it. And we believe it in such a way that we live it with all of our lives, all of our heart, all of our souls. And so that, that's what he's after is the obedience of faith. And that's what I'm going to be after from beginning to end. Like a hound dog. So get this. Last week we looked at the church and we said it was a, a church full of mirrors that were to reflect the manifold wisdom of God and to show the world the glory of what happens when people from all walks of life come under the lordship of Jesus Christ and the fruit that it produces and, and, and all of those things uh, is, is, is what we were looking at. And so my question is, how do we be those kind of mirrors? And the only way is by the gospel saturating our hearts, bringing about the obedience of faith that will flow from Southside Bible Church. And God then will get all the glory with what will start coming out and flowing and showing forth in this world. And so the gospel, I want you to hear where Paul leads it all in Romans eleven thirty three, As he goes through the gospel, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor? <laughs> who has given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And in Romans 16, what I just read, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. This is it. It's all for his glory. So last time I preached this, I told you the theme was Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation. For the Jew first and then for the Gentile. 
And I still hold to that. That's truth for sure. But I think it's more, I think it's the outworking of this gospel. I'm not ashamed of it because of what it does. Faith. Faith that changes and transforms people. It makes you new and you live different and it all results in the glory of God, which is my chief end, everyone's chief end, God's chief end. So everything is moving to that. So why we will gather together and seek to understand this letter with our minds, our hearts, and our wills is for that glory to emanate and go because of the gospel and what it will do in our lives. What could unify a church more than that? We just are unified in the glory of God emanating from the ends of the earth. And so will you join me and give yourself to this, not passive, And not half-hearted, but in a way that will awaken our hearts to a fever pitch for the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring about the obedience of the faith so that he will get all the glory by each life individually and corporately. And so I want to pray for that and then we'll open up Romans. Father, why Romans? Because it's your gospel. It's the way you'll be glorified. This gospel just emanates and gives you glory. And it changes and transforms lives in a way that law never could. Oh God, what grace can do in lives to come under its rule and reign. Lord, we'll we'll give you glory. And so I pray that you will bring about the obedience of faith in each one of our hearts. God, let no one just mark up their notebooks and just leave it there. God, would you meet us in this book? And we would work hard to understand it. But Lord, that the fruit would be faith that believes it and goes and lives a radical life different from this world, but one that's pleasing to you. And so God, we're tired of apathy. We're tired of meandering and none of us ever want to be lukewarm. God, that scares us. And so I pray that you would meet us here in a powerful way. I pray that you would revive us in these glorious truths. God, meet us in a mighty way. Do what no human being can do, but by your Spirit, illuminate our minds and stir our heart with affection and activate our wills for the living God. So God, we open up our lives and our hearts to this word, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. Romans 1.1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, but was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's Paul's introduction. It's very normal. The author is Paul. The recipients are the saints in Rome. He gives his normal greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's desires for the gospel, the one that God gave thousands of years ago, and in the fullness of the time, Christ Jesus has come and fulfilled it. And Paul wants to sow that into the hearts of this church, a church that he didn't plant. He says, I haven't even been there yet. Some commentators think it may have been from Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit was poured out that some of those went back to Rome and took the gospel and the church began there. This morning, I just want to take a look at the man, the author of Romans. So I'm not going to say it, that all was introduction. Sorry. Let's look at the text. We're going to look at the author this morning. Verse 1, and I promise you we will pick up the pace after this morning. Paul, Paul, he was named Saul after the king of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin. 
In Acts 9-11, he was born in Tarsus, modern-day Turkey. Tarsus was the center of Greek learning and culture. It was a metropolis. It was home of one of the most outstanding universities in Roman Empire, and Paul attended it. He studied under one of the best, Gamaliel, in Acts 22-3. Paul said he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was committed to the law in every detail. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was a Pharisee, so he had memorized the whole Pentateuch. The Greek word for Pharisee kind of meant set apart. So Paul had been set apart unto the law and a very strict adherence to every aspect of it. They were the most zealous people in their pursuit of righteousness to obey the law. And Paul was that. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. We're told that he was advancing in Judaism far beyond any of his contemporaries. Paul was the head of the class. His father was a Roman. (laughs) He was a Roman citizen, we're told. And he was a brilliant man. We know for sure that he spoke Greek, Aramaic, and Latin. And he was amazingly gifted. And now at this point, Christianity is beginning to spread. And Paul is offended by this new sect. And so Paul has become a leader in persecuting Christians. And when Stephen was stoned for his beautiful gospel message, listen in Acts 3. But Saul began ravaging the church entering house after house and dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. And in Acts 9.1, now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found anyone belonging to the way, Christianity, both men and women, he might bring them bound in Jerusalem." And so Paul is just persecuting the church. He hates anyone who names the name of Jesus Christ. And he leaves for Damascus. He's had enough fun in Jerusalem. There's about 150,000 people that live there. And so he goes on a journey. It's about 160 miles northeast of Jerusalem, about six days of travel. And as he's traveling in Acts 9, he's going to get converted. Paul's going to be drastically changed when Jesus Christ's glory stops and shines. And, and all of a sudden he sees it and he says, who are thou, Lord? It means courier, which means God. Uh, I'm persecuting anyone that names this name. And now he sees his glory and goes, who are thou? Are you God? And in Acts 26, 14, it says, why do you kick against the goads, Paul? That's a long pointed stick to herd stubborn livestock. It was a common expression to indicate opposition to deity. Paul, you're opposing the very one you think you're pleasing. <laughs> you're, you're opposing me. And in Acts 9, 5, he said, who are thy Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. <clears throat> Paul must have been terrified. He was shedding the blood of God's people. This Jesus was indeed God. And now he's exposed and and helpless by the glow of this revealed majesty of Jesus Christ. Paul is so hostile that no Christian could share the gospel with him. God had to, or he would have killed him. In Acts 9.20, immediately he began after this conversion to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues. He sees it, he gets converted, goes into the synagogue, and here was his message. He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on his name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by providing that this Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And now Paul's zeal is placed in the right direction. In fact, he was preaching and arguing with such persuasiveness that in Acts 9, the Jews were trying to kill Paul now. So out of the gate, I just want you to hear this name this morning, Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to bring men into the realm of salvation. Paul, the power of the gospel. And so if you sit here this morning and you've been praying for an unbelieving husband for maybe 30 years and he just seems harder and harder. Maybe you got a kid who used to come to church and now he hates your faith with a passion. Or maybe this morning yourself, 
You sit here saying, if you knew what I did, Pastor, there's no hope for me. And so my message for you this morning is just this word, Paul. Let that just lift your heart this morning is that there's grace for anyone from killing anyone that would name the name of Jesus Christ to now being willing to die for the name of Jesus Christ. This gospel has a power that can subdue and overtake any mind, heart, or will. And so I pray for anyone in here who's never come to this Christ. This is it. Anyone. Anyone. He came for sinners. This gospel has the power to save and change and transform. So this morning we got a a quick outline. Sorry, guys. Paul gives us a three-pronged resume as he begins his letter. In verse 1, we're just going to look at three parts then of Paul. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. He's a captivated slave is my first point. He's a doulos. He, the doulos, again, you remember they, they put the all in their ear if they had their freedom and they said, I love my master and I want to serve him. I want to stay. And so here's Paul saying, I want to serve the king. I'm a willing slave. I'm the happiest slave ever. I love my master. I just want him. I want to obey him. This is my great joy. My freedom is to be a slave to Jesus Christ. I'm free finally. The gospel broke the bonds so I could be a slave of Jesus Christ with my free will, loving, following, and seeking him the rest of my days. What I saw on that road, I will never get over. He's taken my heart and my will. I'm his and he is mine. That is what the gospel does to a heart. When the spirit shines the light of Christ into your heart, this happens. It has to happen. It can vary in degrees, but this has to happen. Did it happen to you? This takes over your life. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm a bondservant. In Acts 20, I don't consider my life of any account as dear to myself for the purpose that I might finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. My life doesn't matter anymore. All that matters is that I obey Jesus and go tell people of the grace of God. He was captivated. And as he's sitting in prison waiting to find out if they're going to cut his head off in Philippi, he writes, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I get out of this prison, my life is Christ. And if they cut my head off, it's going to be gain because I will get more of Christ. All all it was was Christ for this man. He was a Christ-captivated heart. I'm now under the captivity of Christ. Complete devotion and obedience. I'm at the disposal of him. We got a young couple with two little boys that are praying about going to Tijuana to start to to minister at an orphanage. And it was ranked the most dangerous city in the world right now. Why would you do that? Are your parents here? (laughs) Why would you do that? My life doesn't matter anymore. It's Christ. And he said to go. And they just, by faith, are going to go and lose their lives for these orphans to teach them about Jesus Christ. I'm a servant of Christ. I have no rights to my own life. However he directs, I go, I follow, I'm a slave of Christ, not the strokes of this world. So God, breathe on us that we would be awakened to our blessed slavery to Jesus Christ through this gospel. There's not many slaves running around anymore to Jesus Christ. Second, Paul says, I'm a commissioned apostle. I'm called as an apostle. An apostle was an official title for a peculiar office. The definition, it was one entrusted with a mission and a power to carry it out. When you look at an apostle, he had to see the resurrected Jesus Christ to be a witness. 
Listen to what Paul in Acts 1.20, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate and let no man dwell in it and his office let another man take it. It's therefore necessary that one of the men who have accompanied, accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these should become a witness with us of his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 9.1, Paul says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? I've seen him. I've seen the resurrected Jesus Christ, and I have been called to this ministry by God. I've been given authority and a commission from God himself. 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. I showed you the power of God and showed you truly that I'm God's apostle. His power is on me doing things that only can be done by God. And so apostles spoke with authority and to speak as Christ's representative and people must listen to them because they spoke for God. I want you to listen to 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you were received from us, the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God which also performs its work in you who believe. This message we preach was the word of God and you received it as such. Paul is saying, I'm not just writing a letter. I want you to hear this. I'm God's chosen vessel to bring you his very words of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I preached through 2 Peter, Peter put Paul on the same uh, place with the Old Testament scriptures. And he, and he says that the, he spoke in them with the same authority. <clears throat> and so as we begin, I just want you to realize that what we open up are the words of God. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit and Paul was an apostle commissioned. And he is telling us God's message to us here at Southside Bible Church. Third point, Paul was consecrated to the gospel. If you'll look in verse 1, Set apart for the gospel of God. And I just want you to listen to Acts 26. God said to Paul, arise and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I've appeared to you <coughs> to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things of which I will appear to you delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. And here's what you're to do. To open their eyes so that they might turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, in order that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Paul says in Galatians 1, I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. When was Paul set apart for the gospel of God? In Galatians 1.15. But when he who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace on the road to Damascus, was pleased... And so this is amazing. There was a detour between setting him apart before he's even born to the Damascus road was horrendous. God allowed Paul to become the chief of sinners is what he called himself. And I just, as we close, I want you to hear why. <clears throat> and First Timothy gives his testimony. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among who I am foremost of all. So he did it for you this morning. For those who have done something so bad or you feel so guilty over your sin that you think God could never forgive you. Paul's the trophy child of grace. He was killing Christians and he wants you to see that. That God showed even him mercy. And so do you get Romans? Do you get the gospel of Jesus Christ? He's been set apart for the gospel. And just how flippantly we use this term. We should not say this word without bursting into a hymn of praise and thanksgiving. We need to be awakened to the gospel again. The gospel means good news. Paul was a preacher of the law before Acts 9. He had the weights on, and there really was no good news in his life. The law pinpoints sin, and it can never save. And now I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because in it the righteousness of God can be received. And so I was set apart, and I want you to catch this Greek word. It's the same word for Pharisee. And so as a Pharisee, I was set apart for the law. I was set apart to achieve righteousness under the law. That's what a Pharisee was. And now I've been set apart for the gospel. I've been set apart to preach that there's a righteousness that comes by faith and not by works. So I I was set apart for righteousness that you get by your own doing under the law. And now my whole life is to tell you there's a righteousness that is the free gift of God through Jesus Christ. I'm set apart for this gospel. Is that the best news you've ever heard? It's the greatest news. You can have a righteousness now from God by faith. And so Paul takes up his pen, inspired by the Holy Spirit, given all authority from God and his message from God. And he's going to display the good news of the gospel to Rome in all of its fullness and all of its grandeur. And we're going to come and just stare into the face of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And we get to study this. Amen. So in closing this morning, I just want to give you a broad brush outline and just how we're going to approach this together. And when I say a broad brush outline, I really do mean that. (laughs) The bird's eye view of the whole epistle. Chapters 1 through 11 is doctrinal. It's the realities of what God has done in Christ. And then chapters 12 through 16 have a therefore of how do I live in light of this gospel? That that therefore to have this and to have the obedience of faith will bring about this kind of obedience and this kind of life lived for God. So to narrow it in chapter 1 through uh, 17, verse 1 through 17, kind of the salutation and a general introduction, Paul will give you a picture of his heart for this gospel. Then he'll begin the gospel in chapter 118 all the way to chapter 320. And he's just going to show that every one of us are in need of this gospel, whether you're moral or immoral, religious or irreligious. He's just going to come and show everybody needs to be saved. There's none of you that are going to be exempt from this. Then in chapter 321, we get the beautiful but now. What is God going to do about it all the way through chapter 4 and that the gospel of justification that God sent his son to make us right with him through his righteousness and his death. And we'll stare at the glory and the beauty of the cross of Christ. I hope for a long time. Then chapter five through eight, to the end of eight, he shows the secured blessings of the gospel as they're applied and how they're worked out uh, in our lives. And then in chapters 9 through 11, we get a look at the sovereign plan of the gospel with Jew and Gentile and what God has been doing through the history of the world. And he makes this beautiful statement. I think it's verse 32 where he says he did this so that he could show mercy to all. So his his whole plan of redemption is God wants to be merciful to the Jew and to the Gentiles. And so wait till you look at the panoramic view is if you don't land there, you miss history. If you study all of history just to learn history and don't land that God wanted to be merciful to sinners from Jews and Gentiles, you'll miss the whole history of this world. And then in verses 12 through 16, therefore I urge you to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice to God. And what does that look like? 
And he's going to drive it in very precise ways of how we should live in light of this glorious gospel that we're going to stare into. So Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. God is so happy with this gospel. It blesses and it glorifies him. And so I, I pray that the glory and the savor of this gospel would be restored to us, Southside Bible Church, and that we would be lost in love, wonder, and praise. I, I, I won't settle for anything else in my own heart, and I pray that you will not either, and that that would give God glory by what will emanate from this body that I, I pray to the ends of the earth. I, I pray it will go to the ends of the earth, the beauty of what we'll see in this gospel. So in closing... Did I say that before? It's the last time I'm going to say it. Okay, so in closing, this is what I want to ask of you. And you're like, oh, pastor, why do you got to ask stuff of me? I got to ask something of you. And first, I want you to prepare your hearts (coughs) for the word of God. James says that we're to receive the word with humility and plan which is able to save your souls. And so he says, put aside all filthiness and the remains of wickedness. And when we study James, you remember that, that word for filthiness meant wax in the ear? And, and you can get so much wax in your ears, what happens? Huh? I can't hear you. And so the wax in the ear builds up and you can't hear. So some of you have spiritual wax in your ears, and I'm going to preach Romans, and you're going to stare at me dead for five years. And I'm asking you to go before God and say in humility, let me receive this word. Take the wax out. Give give me the little Q-tips and clean out my ears, God. Let me come and get my heart ready. Don't just come drinking up the world, running after everything and walk in here and say, speak to me, God. I'm just asking that you would prepare your hearts and get up early on Sunday and and just say, God, I want to hear your word. Speak to me. Let me get the truth in here. Take out the wax. Let me hear the word of God. Is that too much? I'm so fired up. I just feel for you guys. <clears throat> Secondly, in James 1.22, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not just hearers. And that Greek word for hearer meant an, an uh, auditor. And when you audit a class, you go sit in it and you don't have to do any of the work. You just listen to the lectures. And some of you are auditing this book of Romans. I know you're gonna. And I'm asking you to don't audit. Don't just sit and listen to the lectures. I want you to have the obedience of faith by what we look at and behold. And then in your little bulletins, if, if you got one this morning, I want you to pull that out. In there, there's this little thing called fighter verses. And I stole it from Bethlehem Baptist 20 years ago. And we had a season where we had fighter verses when we went through Romans the first time. <clears throat> and what fighter verses were is as a church, we would look at the verses and memorize the scriptures together And we just picked out verses that we thought would lay a good foundation. But this time I want to do fighter verses through Romans. And I'm going to pick in every section I'm preaching what I think might be some essential verses that we should memorize and and have in our hearts and treasure. So every week there'll be a fighter verse. And if I go slow enough, you might get two or three weeks to memorize the fighter verses. So if I go long, you should be happy. You should be like, thanks, pastor. Now I can get caught up in my fighter verses. And at the end of this... Uh, I'm hoping for a pizza party for whoever memorized all the Roman verses. Okay, at my house, we're going to have pizza and we'll share our verses and just celebrate. But I did notice we went over budget, so we might change it. The church might treat us to the pizza. So, number three. Now, that, that was number three. Number four. I want you to pray for epinosis. And I'm, Paul prays this in Ephesians 1. When he's writing, and every week, I want you to hear the truth and just say, oh God, let that become the the full knowledge where I see the glory of Christ in it. I just don't want academic data. I want to see the glory of Christ in the academic data. And so I'm just praying that you'll fight for that knowledge that changes and transforms you and brings about the obedience of faith. So are you with me? Don't be happy with just learning. Learning. Learning to make me walk like Jesus Christ walked when he walked this earth. Pray for that. 
Fifth, there's some community groups that are sermon-based. If you're not in a community group, I want you to get in one. And, and if you can, I know there's physical and jobs and different things, but if you can, I want you to get in one and really digest Romans together. And if we need another one, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, find a friend maybe and meet for coffee and just say, let's digest Romans together while we go through it. And so just try to dig in in community and discuss Romans and try to understand it better together. Sixthly, get, for those who want to go deeper, <laughs> get some commentaries and on your own be studying this and, and just wrestling with the different uh, issues in this um, book. Um, John MacArthur has a really good commentary it's, you know, to start. My favorite is Robert Haldane. There was a revival from his teaching of Romans. And then Lloyd-Jones, uh, if your brother doesn't take your books, sorry, Steve, where is he? He lent me those 20 years ago. Um, Lloyd-Jones is, has some excellent work on Romans if you want to get in. And then there, there's a lot of other commentaries if you want help and picking one out, we'll do that. And then number seven, I, I want you to pray. I want all of us praying that the sweetness of this gospel would fall mightily upon us in our study. And I've seen and I've tasted it in little ways and I know what it looks like and it can be so beautiful when it lands that way. And so I, I just want all of you to have the, the spirit of intercession praying that you would get it and that Southside Bible Church would, would get epinosis of this. And, and I, I ask that you would pray for me as I'm studying that God would uh, reveal this truth and the beauties of Christ and that I would live everything that I'm learning. I want obedience of the faith and I, I need help. And so I want you to be praying uh, for Pastor Murphy while he's doing this. And so may God be pleased to reveal his precious son to us in deeper ways in the days ahead in this glorious gospel should he tarry. Let's go to our God and pray. Father, I come come before you accepted in love because of this gospel. And I pray now, Lord, as we dive in and delve into its beauties and its glories that you've revealed by your spirit through Paul, God, I pray that you would meet us. I do pray that this would be a revival. I pray that you would just awaken our hearts to these truths. Let no one just know them in their heads, but that all of us would get them so deep in our hearts that we would unify and give everything that we have to the advance of this gospel. God, I just pray do, do more than we could hope, ask, or think during this time in Romans. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.